Well, when uh, I heard that you were giving this talk today, I was uh, really delighted to be given the opportunity to make a few opening remarks. Uh, really more out of uh, friendship with Jim than anything else. Uh, I'm frequently invited to make opening remarks at various events on the campus. It's in my job description. But rarely do I get a chance to introduce somebody on the campus whom I can call a friend. And Jim has been a wonderful supporter and a very interesting person to get to know. Uh, when I think of Jim Sheely, I think of spending time around books, uh, art, um, and other cultural artifacts. Jim has taken me on visits to the Mercantile Library. Of course, we've had a tour of his remarkable collection here in the special collections part of the library, the 300 lithographs, engravings, sketches of the Civil War era, one of the finest collections of its kind to be found anywhere in the United States, a tremendous resource for our faculty and students, and some of those uh, prints and engravings you can see uh, up on the bulletin board over there. So Jim is really um, an academic friend to the university, and it's an, a privilege to introduce him here today uh, as a student, and I guess more in an academic role, giving a learned talk. I also want to say that it's um, terrific to see Jim back in really great health again. Uh, as many of you who know Jim realize, um, he had a pretty severe medical experience last uh, December, and it's just great that he's bounced back 100% as vigorous as ever. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is that um, I was at a meeting of the American Council of Learned Societies last week in Washington, D.C., and heard a talk by um, the president of New York University, John Sexton. He said he was going to get up and talk about IT. And of course, everybody assumed not another lecture about computers and all the challenges that universities face about computer technology. But what he really wanted to talk about was two types of learners. And he said the new jargon is that you have I-learners and T-learners. And the I-learners are the ones who follow a very narrow path in their career. And he thought the job of universities was to produce T-learners who would flourish and expand out the further down the line they went. And it's pretty clear to everybody, I think, in this room who knows Jim that he's a T and not an I. And today we'll hear uh, some of his most recent tea work in the area of uh, Civil War research. So Jim, uh, welcome. I think most of my tea experience relates to Lipton's. <laughs> Those are very kind remarks that Gary made, but Gary, uh, thank you, and Itai, thank you for uh, inviting me today. I would simply like to recognize uh, uh, the Center for New Institutional uh, Social Sciences, uh, leader, founder, Doug Moore. Doug, thank you, and thank you, Elizabeth Case, for coming today. I would, uh, I would also simply, in glancing around the room, uh, recognize my, my, my chief mentor, uh, Ivor Bernstein, sitting back here. Ivor, thank you for being here. Bob Virgil, and especially Steve, thanks for providing a home for me at the Green Brown Center. It's the first opportunity I've really had to publicly thank you for doing that. Um, <coughs> I didn't either hesitate. Now, I'm going to read mostly so that this fits into the correct time. Uh, uh, so it fits between the white lines in terms of baseball parlance. Uh, we're going to see some pictures up here on the board, and I'll probably rant and rave about that for a while. But I'm going to try and keep this within the context which I have intended it so that we may have some uh, interesting, provocative questions at the end. But reading ahead, I didn't either 
inherit this interest in 19th century American history or discover it during the seventh inning of a Cardinal baseball game in which I might be sitting with uh, Dick Mahoney over here, who would far, be far rather interested in talking about Churchill than he would about Custer. Is that <laughs> but like the Cardinals, it has truly been a lifelong passion. Uh, the enigma of George Armstrong Custer has resonated across thousands of pages of books and uh, literally hundreds of pictures, mostly as prints. <coughs> His stunning defeat at the Little Big Horn River in July 1876 by Sioux Chief Sitting Bull and a couple of thousand of Sioux warriors stands as the most widely written and discussed battle in all of U.S. military history. Uh, it caught my attention very early in life. Uh, in my opinion, it constitutes one of three battles fought in North America in the latter half of the 19th century that most significantly shaped the course of events in our country. The other two were Civil War battles on Tiedem in 1862, Gettysburg, July of 1863. Prior to the Civil War between, uh, uh, or the war between the states, uh, there were several people who stood tall in their beliefs of what was right about America or what needed to be changed. And incidentally, whereas the collection over in uh, 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 the collection over in Olin centers, more or less, on the Civil War. I pay a lot of attention to the period of abolition because it was so important. And uh, also the period of uh, emancipation of slaves in the United States as well as Reconstruction and then the final move west. Among those leading abolitionists were Harriet Beecher Stowe, John Brown, William Lloyd Garrison, Charles Sumner. There are many, many more, but we have just great prints of those four, which we'll see on the silver screen in, in, uh, shortly. On the other hand, there were a number of close pro-slavery leaders who surely made their presence felt. It was John C. Calhoun, Jefferson Davis, in the Army of Northern Virginia stood Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee. Uh, on display today, we'll see a, a great shot of um, Lee. Towering well above the crowd was Abraham Lincoln. We go deep with Lincoln. He shows up many times in the Sheely Collection at Olin, and we lead off with a great lithograph of Lincoln, which just happened to be, accidentally to be, a very, very rare print. We think maybe one of a kind, we're not sure. Um, I'm going to give a, 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 just a brief, a, a brief uh, recap of uh, some of the highlights uh, surrounding the battles that took place between April 1861 and, eight, and 1865. I shall do that when we show the pictures on the screen. But uh, again, the three of the most important in the Civil War was the opening major conflict at uh, Manassas, Virginia, also known as the First Battle of Bull Run. July of 1861, uh, Antietam in September of 1862. And I'm going to quote James McPherson, so you don't think that these are all my ideas that I'm spilling out here. Uh, Gettysburg, of course, the seminal battle of the Civil War. Lincoln had said, the war came on. So what brought on? all of this. What caused uh, the war between the states? states? Was it in the South a violation of the Constitution in the United States? Was it states' rights, <coughs> tariffs? I think they all played in. But if I could make one point today before you drift off watching these things, I would simply tell you that 
uh, in my mind's eye, in years of looking at this, the issue was clearly slavery, and more specifically, slavery in the territories. I'm going to quote just briefly here three important from three important speeches that were given just prior to the war. Seward, William Seward, who was a candidate for president in 1860 in the Republican Party, and in 1858 gave a speech in which he shed, said, shall I tell you what this collision means? That meant the growing uh, confrontation between the North and the South. They who think that it is, it is accidental, unnecessary, the work of interested or fanatical agitators, and therefore ephemeral, mistake the case are altogether. It is, quote, an irrepressible conflict between opposing and enduring forces. And it means that the, that the United States must and will sooner or later become either entirely a slaveholding nation or entirely a free labor nation. In, um, at the Cooper Union address that Lincoln gave in February of 1860, as he now sought to become a national figure in the Republican Party, Lincoln said that um, that instrument, he's talking about the Constitution of the United States, is literally silent about any such right. We, on the contrary, deny that, that such a right has any existence in the Constitution, even by implication, and that is the right to hold slaves. Slavery in the territories had become and remained the contentious issue that simply could not be easily worked out. Lincoln answered the notion of popular sovereignty, meaning voting slavery up or down in the new territories by saying, quote, that if one man would enslave another, no man should object. With the expansion of the United States west into the new territories, Southerners simply saw their majority hold on Congress dissipating without the ability to control new territories and states. And finally, in his House <coughs> Divided speech, Lincoln said, a house divided itself against itself cannot stand. That happens to be a biblical quotation. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become one thing or it will become all the other. Lincoln. But what brought on all of this? What, what really happened? Well, we're going to uh, express some of this in uh, pictures. The last half of the 19th century was a critical time in our nation's history because the landscape might have forever remained divided between industry and farm, slave and free, darkness and light. Some of these pictures were produced many, many times so that many people who hadn't been witness to such uh, images before saw them as a way to help resolve their own personal feelings about a nation divided into a cultural landscape in which there was no right or wrong. The prints tell the story. On with the show. Uh, I might just mention here that uh, this dev device is, has, is as far as I'm advanced in the technical world as, <coughs> since I was more recently taught to, how to turn on the television. <laughs> I even know how to do it. I've even learned how to do this backwards. But uh, this is the rare print of uh, Lincoln. And, uh, The Emancipation Proclamation uh, sits on the desk in front of him. It's my very, very 
favorite Lincoln. It was uh, produced by the Kellogg Company back in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, and uh, I believe this came on in 18, uh, shortly after the proclamation uh, came out. But um, this is uh, this is a Lincoln, well composed, confident. Never knew at the time that uh, that the picture was going to be so rare. Again, it's been estimated it might be the only one in uh, existence, which is again why I like to show it. I had no idea at the time, of course. Uh, this is uh, a uh, an illustration that we use often in in showing uh, showing the exhibit. It's a um, uh, it's a wonderful snapshot of a soldier in a slave cabin reading the Emancipation Proclamation from a newspaper, no less. We have one of those original newspapers in the collection back in the Olin Library. Most of the order, the general orders that were issued were in um, eight and a half by 11 that uh, went, out, went out to the troops. But I always thought it was fascinating that this, uh, this trooper was reading it from, uh, from the newspaper. Highly stylized, uh, as, as you can see. Most slave cabins didn't have wood floors, high ceilings, huge stone fireplaces, but uh, it, gets, it gets the point across.